that that's a really good idea. Um, is Nick one of the people that is here? Uh, I guess not. <laughs> uh, is Tom I think here? William Wallen is here. Yeah, Bill is here. So okay, I'm going to start recording. Okay, go ahead. So this is Bill. Your question seems to be a continuation of of yesterday's, uh, referring uh, the the you're referring to the technique there that we discussed yesterday. Of, um, Okay, so as a result of the learned technique to release repetitive negative emotional grasping traces as felt sensations of tension or contraction anywhere in the body, they may appear. My, appear, my experience of PT, which was formerly patchy and transient, comes more frequently, persistently, and extensively on and off the cushion. I discovered a place somewhere around the throat such that when attention is placed there, it really augments the PT in those dimensions. Uh, would giving more attention to this location be helpful to lead to using the pleasure of PT as a pathway into jhana or access consciousness? Um, yes, so um, if that is producing a when you when you say PT, I wasn't sure as I was reading it whether you were referring primarily to energy currents uh, that sensation or to uh, uh, the feeling of joy. Uh, it sounds when you make reference to to the pleasure jhanas that you're ref you're referring to the the mature form of PT, which is the joy and the associated pleasure and uh, so on and so forth. Is that right? Well, I, I, what I experience is um, the tingling that, the tingling and tingling moving sensation mm -hmm. that goes through the body yeah. uh, that were previously maybe more in the lower extremities or uh, the lower trunk yeah. um, now have uh, moved up to include the head and neck and and then I just by moving my attention around mm -hmm. I found this area that is sort of around the throat uh, maybe uh, actually this morning it was uh, in the back of my neck area uh, and whenever I put my attention there those sensations become much stronger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was wondering if that would be helpful or if there's any danger about putting attention there. Um, I wouldn't think so. And you're making the jhanas that you're making reference to using that for the pleasure jhanas. So it would be the pleasant, pleasurable aspect of the experience. So I would think quite the opposite, that uh, doing this from a place of stronger PT would just make it that much easier to access, uh, uh, to reach access and, and enter jhana. I can't see any danger or problem in that because with those jhanas, you're, you're, you are focusing on a, a the physical body or a part of the physical body anyway, although you're putting the emphasis on the actual um, Vedana of pleasantness more so than the the bodily sensation as bodily sensation. So it, this is completely consistent with that. And I would see, you know, it'd be if, if uh, Having had that experience, it seemed like a really logical thing to do would be just to play around with it and see see if you can use it to enter John. I mean, when you're at that stage, it's really much less about, you know, is there a right or a wrong way to do it than your own exploration and discovery. And you're, you are 
you are very well qualified to make the judgment of whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing if you try it out. It seems to me that it's most likely going to turn out to be a good thing in that context. When you're trying to enter into a deeper jhana, you want to be more reviewed, more removed from the physical, from the actual uh, sensory information coming from the sense organs of the body. You know, uh, the way it's referred to traditionally is the the mind is withdrawn from the senses, uh, which is, I guess, how it feels, but. For that, but that's a that's a deeper jhana, and that really doesn't apply to this very much. So, but as a way to enter access for deeper jhana, this would also be appropriate as well, because then you could take some um, something like the illumination phenomena, or the nada sound in the ears, or something like that, and use that uh, as a meditation object for deeper jhanas. That kind of makes sense to you? Well, yeah, it, I was just, uh, I just happened to bump into this. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, when I've had this sensation of the energy flowing through the body, mm -hmm. I have not really concentrated either on the flow itself or on the feeling of pleasure. Mm -hmm. But uh, since I sort of found this way that seems to enhance Mm -hmm. uh, I almost think that it may be an entrance into flow yeah. that that would allow these other stages to take place and and drop the sensation and just get mm -hmm. into the pleasure and then eventually drop that pleasure and get into I don't know the, the joy or happiness mm -hmm. whatever is higher. I I read that in the uh, Lee uh, Brasington or yes Lee Brasington's book right yeah. Lee Brasington's book. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to just sort of say, I, in some ways, I sort of uh, describe that problem of um, of dealing or dismissing emotions, maybe incorrectly, mm -hmm. because it, it really ends up being sort of the grasping uh, onto the emotion or the or the uh, grasping or, or contraction, which is a resistance to the emotion. Right. Okay. That. You know, uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, uh, you know, when we were talking about it yesterday, I, j I just wanted to make it really clear uh, to everybody else that was listening that, you know, we weren't encouraging kind of the wrong kind of dismissing because, I mean, we didn't really, none of us had direct access to the teaching itself, only your summary of it. But that makes total sense. I mean, it. Uh, yeah, uh, you make a couple of things here. You you make mention of of uh, this as being something that you just bumped up against that may be useful. But if you think about it, that's that's how uh, uh, most of these things happen. Is somebody bumps up against it, they play around with, it, they discover, they find where it's useful and where it's not. You know, and. The other thing I wanted to comment on uh, is that, uh, uh, and, and I, I probably did yesterday, so I'm, I'm going to say very much about it now, is that that um, the areas you're talking about, uh, the, the description sounds as though they're related to uh, the chakras, uh, the chakra system in the sense of perhaps the uh, the uh, throat chakra, chakra in the central canal. And I just, once again, it's like, as I say, every time I turn around, there's another piece of information coming at me from somebody else in another way that, that these energy systems and these practices that emphasize the energy systems, this is all connected in a way, and I think there's, there's a tremendous, it's going to be tremendously profitable for somebody, any one of you or eventually somebody else to just explore the interface between the body and mind, mental state, so on and so forth in the form of uh, these energy movements and, and see what that's telling us about both of them because in a sense it's kind of represents uh, 
the juncture of the two in terms of the various phenomena people experience in meditation. So it's just one more. I just wanted to say that it's one more thing that keeps that in my mind immediately triggered this, this, hey, the whole energy thing is really worth getting into. <laughs> Understanding better. Well, the other the other aspect of this is that, um, you know, when you said you, if you rewrote the book, you might include something like this. Well, I don't think it, I would be the expert that I should re, you know, you should refer to. I could refer you to the <laughs> two teachers yes. that I had that, you know, really are, are have much greater depth and, <laughs> and, and in such broad facility in using this, you know, yeah. both with I, me, mind phenomenon, yeah. uh, with feeling powerless, mm -hmm. with resisting things. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the, they're, they're just really yes. uh, incre incredibly creative. Well, I, I, I promise you, Bill, uh, regardless of the very high, uh, the enormous esteem I hold you and your experience in, I wouldn't use you as a reference. I would, as, <laughs> uh, before I put any of this into the book, I would, I would, I or whoever might help me uh, to do this, we'd look very carefully at the originally sourced. <laughs> <of the book. laughs> uh, but uh, thank you for saying so. <laughs> Okay, well, we got a few more people. Let's see. Uh, okay. There's Nick and Tom. I don't think they've arrived yet, but um, uh, Nathan, are your heartbeats here? Is Nathan here? No, I guess. Uh, and I'm I pronouncing your name correctly, Harpreet? Yep, that's right. Oh boy, did I luck out. Well, I'm glad. Thank you. Okay, you say, are there laws that govern us and the universe as a whole? I've read about the law of karma, law of attraction, law of correspondence, and a few more, but their descriptions vary. Could you describe some in brief or point us towards an authentic book for a list and description of these laws? Well, uh, that, that's a fascinating uh, idea. Uh, of course, laws, um, you know, there's, there's, when we talk about natural laws, there is a very, uh, very specific definition to this. And some of these things are, um, defining or, or, or using a looser definition and some are basically trying to propose what is more at the level of a hypothesis technically speaking as a law i mean as as uh hypotheses theories and laws are uh defined in the scientific sense uh a hypothesis is uh an idea that you have about how things work and you have some reasonable evidence from whatever sources that this is uh, an explanation explanation behind a particular set of phenomena um, if it proves to, if if when it's tested in as many ways as people can think of over an extended period of time then it achieves the it moves beyond being a hypothesis to being a theory and a theory is basically a hypothesis that is belongs to the special category of not having been proved or transcended so like some natural laws end up being ultimately being disproved the you know the the some uh, the phlogiston theory behind uh, the uh, action of muscle uh, of muscles um, uh, stood as a good theory at one time in, in history for because it could be used the flow of this uh, 
uh, mysterious fluid could be used to explain things. But then ultimately, the interaction of actin and myosin and the breakdown of ATP and, uh, you know, and the fibers within individual muscles uh, completely replace that. So that's one of the destinations that a, a theory can have. The other is that it can be like uh, the, the Newtonian theories of physics, which uh, continue to be natural. Uh, they continue to be uh, consistently uh, demonstrable, but the context, it's found that they are within a limited context. So uh, people usually treat uh, uh, Newtonian laws as being uh, uh, natural laws, but we now know that that as as theories uh, that they are theories of limited applicability at a particular scale of of size in the in, in the universe, and that as you go larger than that scale or lower than that scale, that they no longer apply. So. The idea of a natural law is something that, uh, you know, we could speak of the law of gravity, for example. Now, here's something that is the outgrowth of uh, a kind of experience which has been researched at so many different levels that we can speak of it as being a natural law. That, uh, that there is a force generated that we name, that we call gravity, uh, that is uh, the result of a field uh, associated with another property we call mass. So the combination of mass and the field that, uh, grav uh, that we call the gravitational field gives rise to the law of gravity. So now we take this word law and we take the law of karma, for example. Um, well, what are we really talking about there? Uh, if we're talking about the law of karma that was, well, that was the law of karma up until the Buddha redefined karma, and that continues to be the law of karma, even amongst probably the majority of Buddhists, is something that doesn't even, up doesn't even uh, um, enjoy the status of being uh, a, a, a good hypothesis anymore. Uh, what we see now is that uh, that uh, as, the, as the the Buddha pointed out that when I when he says karma, in other words, karma means action, and it referred specifically to action with moral consequences. He says that. For me, karma is intention. So he shifted the meaning, but then everything else that goes with it remains the same, except that the way that it works is that your uh, an individual's intention determines the nature of that individual, and therefore determines not what happens to them, but what uh, what um, who it happens to. Uh, how they are going to respond, react to things at, at another time. Um, and instead, there is the law of cause and effect. So we, cause and effect, therefore, is, is sort of a global principle that belongs in the category of laws. Now, the mechanisms by which the laws of cause and effect work, uh, that in itself involves a variety of things, some of which fall into the category of, of, of scientific laws, like the law of gravity is most definitely one of the aspects of the law of cause and effect. You following me here? So it's a real, it's a real definition. Now these other things like the law of attraction, well, um, I remember reading through, uh, a thick volume a few years ago called Think and Grow Rich. You may uh, come, have come across that. And of course, um, 
there's been many of those things since, and they're, they're the law of attraction, and and these there there are different gurus of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, basic sort of idea that uh, you can attract anything that you want to you, whether it's money, love, or whatever it happens to be, uh, uh, by this law of, of attraction. Well, there, that's using a very loose definition of a law. Okay. What it's saying is that, uh, um, well, when I read Think and Grow Rich, I, I read through the whole thing and I said, what's he saying? Well, he's saying that if you totally fix your mind on becoming wealthy, what is going to happen is that you are naturally going to gravitate towards sources of information uh, that are, are going to teach you how to become wealthy. You're going to be much more interested in talking to somebody who has succeeded in making a lot of money in the stock market or in a particular uh, business venture or something like that than you are that somebody wants to talk about baseball games or the weather, right? Uh, you, you tune into those things that have to do with, with the increasing of wealth rather than the decreasing of wealth. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's like, it, it's actually the same process by which uh, the Dharma is intended to guide us towards uh, a whole different perspective on, on reality by bringing uh, many aspects of our intentional focus in line with wanting to realize the fruits of, of the Dharma. So we could say think and grow rich, uh, law of attraction, things like that, that in a sense they're attempting to, to describe a broad range of things um, and they do so in different people's hands to a greater or lesser degree but what you're really asking about is uh, as I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong is just this broader thing that you what we come across in the world are all these different uh, the law of correspondence that you mentioned and things like that that people talk about as laws uh, and I think what you're getting at with this is what, what is the actual nature and status of those things that are commonly referred to as, as laws in many different ways. And uh, I, I, my intention, and I don't know if I succeeded or not, my intention is to just kind of point to exactly that. Now, your suggestion that, uh, what if somebody collected together all of these things and did a sort of um, large scale analysis of the way, uh, the way that all of these different things, or what all of these different things that people might refer to as laws in this sense, uh, what what do they have that's valid that's in common? What do they have that's valid but is different from each other? And to what degree um, are they uh, uh, of either limited validity or just wishful thinking, right? Now that might be very useful to us because what that, that would help us in our thinking and if uh, if that kind of if that kind of information were something that were taught to people when they were young, then they could probably uh, make far better use of the consistencies and phenomena that people turn into laws without at the same time becoming vulnerable to all of these people that want you to come to a very expensive seminar and learn how you're going to get everything that you want. <laughs> um, 
Bye. I, um, I came across a few books that have all the laws. The reason I asked you this question is when I was growing up in India, everything revolved around the law of karma. So yeah. we believe that whatever we did would come back to us. And if something bad happens to somebody, we would say they would have bad karmas. Right. But then I realized life doesn't really work that way. We always see, or we usually see people mm -hmm. we have known to not be that good, would always attract good things in their lives. So there is a definition of karma or law of attraction that we still don't know about, or we haven't been able to interpret it properly from our resources, from mm -hmm. Sanskrit yeah. or wherever. So um, that's that's the reason I asked you if there is an authentic soul that you believe would have a list or you know understanding of these laws, which can help uh, us better. Yeah. 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 There isn't that I know of. That doesn't mean there isn't, because uh, there's more things I don't know of by far than things that I do. They're out there, and one of the joys of life is every day. I literally every day. I speaking to somebody and they tell me about something new that I didn't know. Um, but if we take, for example, exactly what you noticed about the law of karma, that was the, you know, the law of karma, the only way it could stand up is to join it with the law of, with, of reincarnation or the belief in reincarnation because it obviously didn't hold up. People that did bad things, you know, seem to be rewarded by it and people and you know the same thing they say no good deed goes unpunished right <laughs> so yeah so you have to, you you have to posit reincarnation you have to have posit i mean even even in uh, uh the abrahamic re religions where there's a heaven and a purgatory and a hell you have to posit some other place where this justice gets exercised because it can't be within the life because we look around and we see that that doesn't happen at all. Uh, but that's what was so, you see, the law of karma, it, it's the law of, I, I mean, literally it is the law of action and mm -hmm. cause and effect is the law of action and reaction, right? Mm -hmm. So the, part of the law of karma that is really true if you go around being uh and you are a kind and generous and uh, trustworthy person then you will reap the benefits of that and that's cause and effect if you go around being mean and nasty and cheating people and things like that you're, that's going to come back to you as well but that's just cause and effect and unfortunately Cause and effect is such a complex thing that involves so many processes that um, you can be a hired killer for the mafia and live very well. <laughs> Enjoy great yeah. benefits. So. Yeah, so um, I'll explore more. Yeah. Uh, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, what you're looking at is really important. That's what... Uh, scientists, philosophers, and probably any any person uh, who is not totally engaged in the realm of just purely the pursuit of, of material and sensual and, and the sensual is an understanding of what what are the various forces and processes that that the universe operates according to, and that's. So that's that's a wonderful interest of yours. Yeah, uh, I mean, this this is an audience that appreciates that, and we're all doing that in some way or another. Okay. And it's I'm I'm glad you're looking at the particular aspects of it that you are because they deserve to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your question. That was very good. So let's move on and. Uh, see what another good question that we have here to talk about is i liked i liked your your description of of the karma as flowing through this whole life that not only is the karma creating habits that we repeat <laughs> but then our interaction with others carries mm -hmm. that karma forward in our effect on those yes you know whether or not like if we raise children well they they learn our bad habits, or they learn our good habits. Right. Yes. So, 
I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, I think it, it's just like uh, Joanna Macy wrote that book yeah. about uh, Buddhist determinism and, and uh, systems view of reality. Uh, mutual causality in Buddhism. Right. Uh, yes. And yes. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I had a thought. I'm just trying to see if I could get it back, uh, if it was worthwhile. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think uh, the Buddha brilliantly penetrated what it was that the law, the law of karma that was based on actions and moral consequences was really trying to to point to which is that uh, every action arises out of an intention and the actions and the intent the consequences of the actions and intentions can be uh, wholesome or unwholesome but independently of each other because you mentioned parenting uh, you can intend to be the best possible parent and you raise a child that has serious difficulties because they never experienced appropriate discipline as they were growing up, for example. Or a parent who is just the opposite, who, who really wants their children to be uh, good people who succeed in the world and so on and so forth, and yet their children grow up uh, uh, having felt like having been su subject to too much discipline and too narrow thinking and they may react against that as adults and it may have the opposite effect so yeah that's the law there there's another law for you very important law the law of unintended consequences yeah so that's why it's so important to separate intention from consequences the, uh, the, uh, of actions uh, to separate intention from the actions because uh, the Buddha gave us a formula by which to judge intentions. Do they arise out of craving? Uh, do they reinforce attachment to the self? And do they create unnecessary harm and suffering in the world? Uh, where you take actions and the best thing that you can do is uh, try to predict your actions and act with the best intention. But that doesn't mean the consequences are going to be what you expect them to be. And so you just have to accept that as it is and do your best. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think the simplest thing for me to do now is, is I've just been scanning here and I don't, I don't see any questions from anybody who's actually listening at the moment? Did I? And if I missed a question from some, one of you, then please say so. Uh, and then I've got two ways I can go here. Uh, one is what I've done in the past is just start answering questions uh, that have been asked by people that aren't there, which is a, here, which is a very reasonable thing. The other thing I could do is say, well. Before we start doing that, is there anyone here that has a question in their mind that they didn't have a chance to, to post for everybody's benefit? Because, or maybe that's arisen out of something that someone has said so far. So let me just put that out to you. Does, does anybody have a non-posted question they feel like it's really, that they really like to have addressed? And if not, we'll go look at some of those wonderful questions that people aren't here to produce. Okay, so for those of you who will be listening to the recording, your, your questions are up next. And uh, uh, and yes, so let's first, I think what I'll, since we're doing it this way, I'm going to begin with, if I can get myself sufficiently oriented, with questions from 
uh, yesterday that we didn't address. And so I'm looking at the wrong set of questions for that right now. It must be down here. Um, yes, here we go. So uh, Vladislav asked a question yesterday, and you, you can find it on your Patreon screen here. So I've heard that you were into shamanism and psychedelics at some point in your life. Could you please elaborate more on this topic and tell us what practices were you engaged in and how did shamanism, psychedelics affect your spiritual path? For the shamanistic side of it, um, I trained uh, for, uh, and I, I trained and organized workshops um, uh, with, uh, with and for uh, Michael Harner and for some of Michael Harner's senior teachers. So uh, uh, Michael Harner teaches what he calls core shamanism. Um, he was, I believe, uh, a, a professor in an anthropology department. And he, his primary area of study was shamanism in many, many cultures. And what he did was to uh, examine the core aspects of, that all of, that every shamanic culture uh, shared in common with others. Uh, and so out of this, he developed a core shamanism. And that's, that's what I initially studied. Um, the core things that he found were uh, the interaction with beings in other realms, and the realms typically would fall into a classification of th this, the realm that we normally dwell in is sort of the, the middle world. And there's an upper world, and there's a lower world, and that in general, the kinds of beings and the kinds of interactions that uh, a shaman or a person who's part of a shamanic culture would have with beings uh, in the upper world is of a different nature than uh, the interactions with beings in the lower world, um, all of which are, are potentially very beneficial. Um, but a very important aspect of core shamanism is that, uh, well, w one principle is that how does one come to be a shaman? I mean, other than studying with somebody who is recognized as a shaman. Basically, there's not like a, a, a declaration by a shaman that, that you, my apprentice, are now a shaman. In most shamanic cultures, it ultimately depends upon the recognition by the people, people who go to the shaman. Now, a second thing that is really a, an important aspect of core shamanism, uh, and we're keeping in mind that that there are such things as, uh, you know, dark, dark shamans and uh, uh, things like that, in various cultures um, and there are cultures in, that include shamanic practices that are for one's own benefit but the most consistent thing in all of shamanism that michael found was that um, the purpose of shamanic practice was for the benefit of others often the major role of the shaman was guiding the the tribal group of uh, whatever size it happened to be. Uh, the group as a whole or parts of the group, uh, it was providing spiritual guidance through the assistance of, of uh, uh, beings in the upper and lower realms. To, uh, and, and lower is not negative, keep in mind. It's just, it's, uh, it, it refers to uh, a different kind of being with a different kind of powers than in the upper realm. So 
this is what I really liked about shamanism. From there, I, after studying uh, Michael Harner's shamanism, which involves learning to journey to the upper and lower worlds. And the other big thing that uh, uh, within uh, Michael Harner's core shamanic teaching has to do with something that's called uh, soul retrieval. Uh, it's based on an idea that when people interact with each other, and especially interact intensely, that sometimes they pick up some something that corresponds to some aspect of the soul of someone else. And likewise, they lose aspects of their own soul. So in the ceremonies of soul retrieval, which is really a beautiful, wonderful ceremony with a lot of uh, things, that so, um, the idea is that you're essentially repairing a person from the kind of damage that has been done at the deep level of the soul through their interactions where they have both uh, picked up pieces of other souls that, that they need to let go of and that they have lost pieces of their own soul that they need to, to get back. Uh, anyway, um, other aspects, Native American culture is not by Michael's definition, um, strictly speaking, shamanic, but it has many shamanic components to it. And I have spent uh, quite a bit of time participating in uh, Native American uh, ceremonial things. I, I mean, I've lived for 23 years in the homeland of the Chiricahua Apaches, and Apaches from other groups uh, also come and do ceremonies there, uh, live in the holy ground of these people. Um, I became acquainted with Navajo shamanism, which is uh, uh, Navajo religious practices, which are some of the most shamanic uh, of Native American practices. Uh, now here we come to the overlap with psychedelics. I used psychedelics uh, at an early stage in my process as a seeker back in the 60s, as did very many of the people that eventually went to India to become, um, uh, 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 to later come back and become uh, well-known teachers. Um, uh, so there's a lot to be learned from psychedelics, even when they're used in an unstructured uh, way by people who are not sure what they were doing. And the closest that people came to that was uh, Timothy Leary uh, and, and what he, you know, before he kind of went too far over the acceptable edge and got uh, uh, fired from Harvard, uh, made a great point of set and setting. Uh, and set refers to your mindset. Why are you engaging in this, uh, uh, in the use of a psychedelic? And setting was also the, the environment, who else was there, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, I learned a lot, as we all did, about one of the main things that one learns from psychedelics, I think, is that the mind can generate absolutely any conceivable reality so that any sense of certainty that's associated with a perception of the way things are uh, is, uh, it just, it can't be sustained if you've had repeated experiences. I think I used about, uh, well, okay let me not attribute it to this because I already had other reasons for knowing that, that no matter what anybody thought, it was empty. <laughs> it was not. But this is one of the things that psychedelics do teach you. And that became really obvious to me is that um, the mind can generate realities that are beyond our ordinary conception. They're so far beyond the consensual reality that we're conditioned to, that uh, uh, they, they seem absolutely fantastic. And they can be experienced 
uh, with a super degree of reality. So we could bring this into the whole thing of, the, of uh, Dharma practice and meditation practice. And people who put a lot of weight on experiences, oh, I've had an experience of this, have ex you know, ex this, these sensations, this, the, you know, um, and these are the people that haven't yet learned the lesson that psychedelics have to teach. Psychedelics have a lot of other potentials too. And uh, there was a period, same period when I was uh, uh, exploring shamanism, uh, I inevitably became involved with uh, the traditional shamanic use and, and shamanic-like uses of the psychoactive substances. So I participated with master roadmen of enormous experience, uh, background of experience and training in uh, teepee ceremonies, peyote ceremonies, Native American church ceremonies with uh, people who were doing, uh, who did uh, ayahuasca ceremonially. And all of these things are, talk about set and setting, they go beyond anything that, uh, that uh, Timothy Leary could have conceived of. Uh, uh, they involve music, chanting, prayers. Uh, there's usually a fairly rigid structure, although the rigidity of the structure varies a lot. Uh, there is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, psilocybin mushroom ceremonies of the, uh, it just keeps slipping in and out of my mind, the name of the tribal group uh, who predominantly used uh, uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, Maria, Sabina, um, sorry, it's gone. Actually, that's good. There's a wonderful thing if it's still available. Uh, uh, a woman by the name of Maria Sabina was a, was a master of the uh, ceremonial use of uh, psilocybin mushrooms. And uh, uh, it was wonderful work that she wrote on that. Um, so peyote, San Pedro, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca, uh, these are all things that I have used in a ceremonial context and come to appreciate that, uh, that the ceremonial context of it is at least as important as the psychoactive drug uh, or substance, uh, uh, we don't think of them as drugs. Having participated in that culture, uh, they are medicines, um, whatever, you know, and they are usually plant medicines, although some are not, like 5-MeO uh, uh, DMT is a secretion from the Sonoran Desert toads uh, glands on their head. All of these can produce profound religious experiences, what I would call insight experiences, uh, and these insight experiences can lead to insight. They can also play an enormously valuable role in psychological purifications. Much of a typical ayahuasca ceremony, if you have an opportunity to attend one, is you'll see a group of people that are are using the ayahuasca are doing a lot of very, very deep psychological purification of the kind that, that we talk about in, in stage four of TMI, uh, that, uh, uh, and as a result of that, now the next step beyond that is these things are currently being used and investigated far more thoroughly as to what what their practical uses are in two domains. Um, the fact is the psychedelics originally, the reason that Harvard professors uh, uh, like Timothy Leary and uh, Richard Alpert, Ram Das, people like that were using these things is with therapeutic intent. Uh, this is also the other Stanislav Grof, uh, people like that. They were interested in 
uh, the therapeutic personal growth and ultimately spiritual growth potentials of these things. People now, and that got banned and shut down and it was categorized as a, what is a class four drug like, you know, heroin and cocaine and things like that, all of these substances. But this has opened up again and people are researching these once again, both for their therapeutic aspect and their uh, spiritual applications. Now, as I hope all of you have come to realize, these are not two different things, that the sort of therapeutic purification is an absolutely essential part of a spiritual path, uh, of every spiritual path. And this is what I discovered in uh, uh, shamanism in the absence of psychedelics and then shamanism that used plant medicines is, is just how, how inseparable these two things are. Um, so let me go back to Nathan's question. I, I always have this tendency to ramble. Uh, so I think I've elaborated more on this topic, which he wanted me to do. Um, <laughs> I have a question if I'm ask. What's that? I have a question. Yes, good. Um, I usually attend the Goenka technique of Vipassana because I have, a, I have very close access to this where I live. Uh, the whole premise of this technique of Vipassana is that, as you know already, that everything that we intend or we do is stored in our body as sensations. And if we observe them with equanimity, mm -hmm. we can eradicate, you know, the old actions that we've done. Uh, using the technique of body scanning is how they do. Uh, when I researched, I realized uh, none of the uh, sutras by Buddha anywhere mention the technique of body scanning or exactly the way it is taught by the Goenka Institute. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about this technique of Vipassana? Well, um, I, th I, I, okay, let's just talk about the, this exploration of the body and body sensations uh, apart from the quote, Goenka system. Uh, I think that it is right on and it's tremendously valuable. And um, when you, what the Goenka method is doing is a, it's a, it's a practical manifestation of the recognition of non-duality of mind and matter, curiously enough. But the people that are teaching it are actually very much dualists, okay? So that's kind of an odd thing about it. They don't, they don't realize it. And, and the reason that I say it's, it's really non-dual uh, in terms of mind and matter, um, if you think about it, what is your body other than a figment of your imagination? Your mind has created a body out of information that's arrived through uh, sensory nerves to the brain from sense organs that detect each of which detects a particular kind of uh, event type of event that's occurring outside of the mind. So uh, the whole light, the electromagnetic spectrum, everything else like that is uh, the result of our trying to determine uh, what it is that actually gives rise to the experience we have of seeing. And also we can include things like that, you know, uh, feeling temperature would be, that's related to the same thing. But um, you, you have an image of what your body is based on what you feel and what you see and what you hear. Other, you, you see your own hand, you see the hands of others, but uh, what you're seeing, uh, you're not actually seeing something that's there. There are ele uh, electrical impulses traveling into your brain and those electrical impulses are what are giving rise to the phenomenon of vision and hearing and everything else. So the whole world, your body included, 
we could, you know, is inseparable from mind. And we go the other way around too. What what is mind? Mind is completely embodied. Um, we we like to get into a kind of dual, dualistic perception of mind as being something unique and special and separate, but uh, it really without without there being something that's at least outside of the direct experience of an individual mind, there would be nothing for a mind to work with. And so a mind needs to be, for a mind to exist, it needs to be embodied. It needs to be in a body that uh, um, has sense organs, so on and so forth. So minds are by nature embodied. And of course, we look at, at uh, the evolution of life and we see that, uh, that mind uh, is, is something that uh, uh, came into existence as we understand it through the development of more and more complex physical systems, bodies, and other bodies in short. Um, so here, here we have the, the classical dualism of mind and body, which is a nat natural tendency of people. Um, those who think more deeply recognize that this is, this is unrealistic. It doesn't match experience. Uh, it's, it's not true. So how do they reconcile? Well, one is to reduce everything to matter and say that mind is just something that arises out of matter. The other thing is to, to reduce everything to mind and say that matter, the world, material world, the body is just a figment of mind's imagination. Mind creates it. And my position is the fourth option, not dualism, not idealistic monism, not materialistic monism, but dualism, or non-dualism, non so that mind and matter neither mind nor matter as we experience it exists. There is something that appears from the inside as mind and from the outside as matter, but it's the same stuff all, all the way through, through and through. So what is, one of the things that I've been kind of harping on as a result of writing my book and then teaching people and realizing the importance of the physical body, uh, I mean, the phenomena, these energy currents we experience, um, uh, are they occurring in the body? Are they occurring in the mind? Or is there really any re meaningful difference between the two? Um, our emotions, we know, are very much embodied to the extent that uh, at one point in the history of psychology, it was believed that emotions were changes in the body that when the brain sensed them, they labeled them as emotions. Uh, of course, that doesn't stand up to experience because that, what that would mean is quadriplegics would never experience emotions anymore, you know, or, or at least their emotions would be limited to those that could manifest through parts of their body where they have feeling. And of course, another thousand or so reasons why that's a uh, a nonsensical limited view, but it went right along with behaviorism, you know. <laughs> uh, the whole, it rejected the whole idea of mind in favor. There's really nothing but behavior, and mind is just a way we have of, of categorizing behaviors, and we've outgrown both of those. But um, uh, I think uh, we don't find in the suttas. Uh, some of the things that I think today, certainly myself as a, as a practitioner and as a teacher working with other people find extremely important, uh, emotions and uh, past conditioning and also anything and everything to do with the embodiment of the mind. Uh, 
energy currents and it's not and buddhism didn't address that but it's not that other others haven't because they have to a great degree this needs to be brought in uh it's you know why why these particular things didn't uh uh don't appear to have been an important part of early Buddhism, uh, it's hard to say. Maybe what the Buddha was doing was just too new and too different that uh, all he could afford to address was certain aspects of it. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe he addressed it at that all, and in all of those that have come between in the last 2,500 years, along the way, they've just lost uh, most of that and things like that. So. It's hard to say, but undeniably, um, you can't. I, you okay. No, I, the reason I asked you this question is because uh, when doing the technique of body scanning and observing sensations, do we develop the kind of insights that we are meant to? Is this an actual insight technique or it's more like a samatha technique? Because I just think that we are developing a better concentration and, uh, Vipassana would be more into developing insights. Is, is, do you think it's, it's possible to develop insights this way? Um, yes, it is. Um, okay. Um, if, if you are indeed doing Vipassana when you do this, uh, and what Vipassana Vipassana isn't insight, but rather it's a way of using the mind and specifically attention uh, to, as the Buddha put it, see things as they really are. Or another way, uh, if we look at the uh, derivation of the word from the original Pali and Sanskrit, it's to see beyond what we normally see, to see to see things as they really are means to see into into various phenomena more deeply than we are used to. So if you do body scanning and you your mind is either already trained or if the body scanning that you're learning is, is taught in a way to encourage this, rather than creating your mind mind creating a story out of everything it pays attention to but rather the mind setting that aside and just observing as clearly as possible what is it that's actually arising in consciousness and allowing that to teach them something then they are doing vipassana and then insights will come uh, and all of the insights the, you know, interconnectedness, if you, if you, I mean, it, it's all there in the body, it's in, inescapably in the body, as is impermanence, the reality that there's only change, uh, as is emptiness, that, uh, that we are superimposing uh, uh, a specific kind of nature to uh, events which they don't really have. I mean, when we say something is empty, we're referring to mental uh, formations, dhammas, so forth. So when we say that, that all dhammas are empty, what we mean is, is that they do not actually have the nature of what they purport to represent, right? So vipassana is a process of seeing things like interconnectedness and impermanence and emptiness, which of course can't help but lead to a realization of no self, and likewise a realization that our suffering is caused by cling, trying to, by not seeing and accepting this truth and trying to cling to a reality that uh, where things aren't so intimately interconnected, where there is some sort of stability uh, and, and permanence to things, even if it's only rel uh, relative, that the uh, dhammas that arise in our consciousness 
are reasonably, even if not completely accurate, they, they, they at least approach some kind of accurate representation of this reality that is outside of the mind. All of that is inherently available, and it, it's actually inherently available in the study of anything, but most definitely the body. And the potential of that, um, certainly I, I appreciate Uba Ken and Ruth Dennison and Goenka and the different ways that they use this. Um, I think that, that uh, in all of these practices, we need to take what they discovered and used and carry it much further. And my feeling about not the body scanning, but the Goenka system is that it is unfortunately kind of fossilized. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot that it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't address. But certainly the core practice can't fault that in the slightest or its power. And yes, you're absolutely right. One could treat body scanning only as a shamatha practice where uh, and where the distinction is is that uh, when you scan the body you're seeing the body uh, not as as an aggregate you're not seeing body as body as an aggregate of processes but you're seeing body as this highly sophisticated conceptualization that we acquire uh, uh, early in life and refine as we go go along. So it's seeing beyond that that makes it vipassana. It's just using the body as a way to train, to develop samatha, to develop stability of attention. Um, and, well, actually that's where I kind of have to back up on what I just said. If one is really developing powerful mindfulness at the same time, then they're not just scanning the body. They're also extremely mindful of the way the mind is reacting to what that scanning reveals. So the more mindful they are, the more they're going to be doing vipassana as well. If we observe uh, the reactions or the sensations of our body, does it change our conditioning, our mental conditioning? Absolutely, yes. It can, in, and there's many possible ways. It depends on what the mind does with that. Um, and that's why having some larger framework, like the Dharma, like the Eightfold Path, is absolutely essential. Because if we take just body scanning and the results that it might produce in the mind independent of the rest of the eightfold path or independent of a system like the dharma it doesn't necessarily have to be the buddhist dharma but uh, independently of some system uh it can go well it's the lesson that i talked about the psychedelics taught, taught us it can go all, any any conceivable direction, as well as some some that you can't conceive until they actually happen. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a follow up question to the psychedelics one. Uh, yes, there's uh, a couple of follow up here. Let's uh, see. Uh, uh, one is, would a strong psychedelic trip be perceived? Uh, an ex example is, is DMT. Uh, be uh, perceived differently by an enlightened being. Would it be even more profound? Is there still a possibility of a bad trip? Is there any value in using psychedelics after that point? Um, well, first of all, we have to drop the idea here of there's just this, you know, on one side of the line is an unenlightened being, on the other side of the line is an enlightened being, and so that we can make these statements about an enlightened being. Uh, enlightenment or awakening is a process. Uh, here I'm addressing you, Vatislav, and I hope you hear this. Uh, it is a process. It's a developmental process. And uh, uh, how would it, it depends on where somebody is in 
in their own process of awakening, um, what would and would not arise out of the use of psychedelics. Well, if somebody were this idealized, perfect Buddha with a totally unified mind and everything else, um, what would there be for them to get out of the use of psychedelics? But since that's sort of a, a mythical, imaginary concept anyway, um, uh, at least as far as I can tell, uh, you know, th that uh, uh, even Siddhartha Gautama himself would have had to live thousands of years and still might perhaps not have reached that stage in his development. I don't know. But um, let's put it this way. Uh, I think that psychedelics can touch into parts of the mind and provide insight into the mind and into reality uh, for uh, anybody at anything, at any stage of awakening short of absolute total awakening. Um, but it would be perceived, of course, very differently. Uh, and and the, I think that there really has to be an intention to learn and grow from that. Um, the most recent psychedelic experience I had was a, a two-night ayahuasca ceremony. And um, I can't say that anything arose that I didn't already know in that. But on the other hand, I didn't go into that uh, ceremony um, really with a mindset that might have allowed it to reveal things to me that uh, uh, it, it didn't. So I would put it more on, on my, uh, the way that I approached it. And right now, I feel like if I were to do some um, uh, do psychedelics and do them with the purpose of understanding myself and my own mind better, I could learn an enormous amount from it. The likelihood of a bad trip, uh, I, I, I think that shrinks enormously. Uh, once one crosses that line into enlightenment, um, there, it, it's, it's only while there's still enough of a propensity to fall into the conviction of uh, being a kind of uh, uh, self, uh, of, of a separate self, of, uh, uh, that, that one would be at risk of a bad trip. Because uh, when there is no attachment to a self and there is no craving arising out of that attachment to self, then you don't have the ingredients that are necessary to produce uh, a bad trip. Um, but then once again, we keep in mind uh, at what point do you reach the place where <laughs> uh, you have so completely eliminated even the subtlest attachments to the sense of self in the deepest and darkest uh, uh, recesses of your mind. Uh, so of course it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the kind of bad trip that somebody had who decided to take a huge dose of LSD recreationally, but it would be, uh, it could have aspects of unpleasantness to it. The other question on a related note that Robert Johansson asks is, I'm curious if psychedelics are considered a break to the fifth precept. And very simply, the answer could be yes or no, depending on how they're used, why they're used, uh, and so forth. Really, the fifth precept is not to, not to pursue the loss of mindfulness um, as an escape from confronting reality. Uh, that's what it's really all about. So put a little more simply, that the fifth precept is about not doing things that produce 
uh, a decrease in mindfulness. And therefore it includes, uh, it, it, it could include any, all kinds of things. It include uh, uh, tele watching television shows. It could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, computer games. Uh, it can be alcohol and drugs. It is anything that results in a, a uh, decrease in mindfulness and particularly an intentional reduction in mindfulness to uh, escape uh, <laughs> escape the reality that mindfulness reveals uh, uh, would be a violation of the fifth precept. But uh, in and of themselves, absolutely not. I just spoke of many positive ways that they could be used. And so, um, let's see what else. There's a question for, from Bert Elsie here the, from yesterday. The, and I know Bert was very, very frustrated at not being able to figure out the time zone thing, something that some of the others of you may have experienced. So I do want to answer his question here. Um, he says, my mind seems to grasp hard at whatever my attention is on, leading to painful tension. I never seem to have much, if any, strong dullness. Because when my introspective awareness notices dullness, instead of getting sleepy, my muscles seem to automatically tense up in order to force sensation. I have to keep the intention to not tense up, or I tense up. Occasionally, I'll get into a great place where I'm relaxed and have really clear sensation and uh, stable attention, stage four, or even five. But before long, I notice that the painful tension snuck in and my breathing is very controlled. Is there a specific technique to learn to regulate effort? How do I let go if any hint of doing so immediately leads to tension that stays with me, even off the cushion? So Bert, this is a question that, uh, first of all, there's certain aspects of it that are really common and uh, worth addressing uh, in their commonality. On the other hand, there are a lot of subtleties that, uh, uh, much more subtle things that occur in meditation and meditative development process that these kinds of tension phenomena can have to do with. So the most common thing, like you, I, I don't know if this is accurate or not, and you're not here to tell me, but the way that you have described this, I would guess that you are very much a sort of type A person who uh, uh, needs to be the doer of things, um, who is probably very successful because of uh, the uh, intensity of the effort that they put into things. Uh, and you're not uncommon. And uh, there are a lot of people to, who have that to an extreme degree and to just a subtle, I, I'd say almost most Westerners have that to some degree. It's very much a part of our culture that you're, you're putting effort and your effort is manifesting as muscle tension uh, because that's just the way the mind body work together is uh, uh, you're intensely trying to solve a math problem or a crossword puzzle and muscle tension develops as the unconscious manifestation of the, of the uh, forcefulness of your internal uh, efforting. In meditation, uh, uh, this is one of the things that is really important to learn to recognize uh, so that you can overcome it because Efforting arises out of the sense that there's some agent who is doing the efforting. And so ultimately you're working against your end goals by doing this all the way along. The other thing though, is that the kind of painful muscle tension that you talk about and things like this, this is going to hold you back in the process of meditation. I shouldn't say you, because once again, I, I'm, in, I'm projecting on your description, but, but for all of, the potential yous out there listening to this uh, for whom this description does fit this 
tendency to put a lot of intense effort into things, this is going to manifest in your body. And it is going to interfere uh, with your uh, development of shamatha. So uh, it is something to be dealt with. Uh, how do you deal with it? You know, you, you, how do you, can you force yourself to stop forcing yourself? Can you, know, can, uh, can you strive for effortlessness? And by striving harder, can you achieve greater effortlessness? Uh, these things are obviously contradictory to each other. So it's, you, you ask, how do I let go? Well, it's the I in there that is the secret to the letting go. Um, all that the I inside your mind can do is shift from one kind of letting go to another kind of letting go. Um, uh, or, well, no, I should say from one kind of efforting to another kind of efforting. So making, making the effort to succeed and then making the effort to let go, but you're still making the effort and that's the problem with it there. So when it comes to letting go, if you're making an effort to let go, then it's not gonna work that way. Um, recognizing that is the very first uh, and most important thing. So whenever you notice that, then you can just practice letting go as a, as a true letting go. It's not something you do, it's a, it's a not doing. So when you feel the tension begin to develop in your neck and shoulders, for example, while you're having this wonderfully clear and stable meditation, uh, all you do is just let those muscles relax. You just, you just intend that they relax. And the same thing applies uh, uh, all the way along is if your intention, so you intend to recognize when you're making effort and then you intend to uh, not make the effort. Uh, you let the body release the tension. You let the mind let go of its own efforting. You, 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 uh, you aren't going to be able to make those muscles relax. You just intend that they not continue. You intend that they uh, relax. You intend that they not continue to remain in a contracted state, and the result is that they let go. And what you're going to experience is the same thing that you have already experienced with stabilizing attention and developing mindfulness, is that uh, uh, you hold the intention. Uh, for a while that intention is fulfilled, then it ceases to be. So then you just renew the intention and you continue on. But uh, you, you try to remember that in, in this process of holding an intention, recognizing when the intention is not being fulfilled and then renewing the intention, there's no doing in there. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's a non-doing and not a doing. And you'll find, uh, you, initially you may find this very difficult, but it will get much easier as you go along. So I um, wish, you wish you'd been able to make it, Bert, but uh, I hope you find this, this helpful. I know it's a very limited uh, kind of, uh, uh, like I said, there's a lot of other aspects to muscle tension showing up in the body. These can be related to what, the purifications we talked about. These can be late related to things that you have to do in terms of letting go of certain forms of craving and things like that in, in the higher paths. Uh, they can be manifestations of all kinds of things. But I just wanted to address the, the most common one is that as that 
the imaginary eye is like their character in the stands at a football game, jumping up and down and screaming and yelling as though all of that activity is going to have some effect on what the quarterback does on the field. So I have a couple more things to add to that. Simple, yeah, sure. so simple options. There's someone who tends to suffer for, from this type of uh, muscle pain, muscle contraction having to do with uh, making a lot of effort. So very often, especially on retreat, when I'd have a lot of time to spend in a sitting position or formally meditating, I would do half an hour or an hour and a half uh, sitting upright and then head over to a place where I can recline and just relax into it. Or even start this way if I'm particularly agitated or excited that day, especially if dullness isn't a problem for you. That's, that's something that can work um, very nicely. And what I find also is that when I get tense, it tends to correspond with me not noticing all sorts of pains that I have in my body in the moment, in my quest to be the most upright meditator in the universe. <laughs> so there are all sorts of efforts in my neck, in my back, um, and other places that yeah. simply have to be relaxed um, after I remem remember, remind myself uh, sort of like the, the flip side of not not having a self, also nothing needing to be done, right? That's that's the other side of it. The self only arises when there's a sense of oh, this has to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Something needs to be achieved. So as soon as I remind myself that meditation isn't about achieving something, I mean, of course we have the stages and everything, right? But there's no particular end goal. There's nothing that has to be done. That's just another way of torturing myself. As soon as I remember that, it's also I get pings all over my body of, oh, th this is where I'm pushing myself. And, mm -hmm. and then this naturally then identifies itself as the effort to then silence another point that's in pain. So a lot of it has to do with the body and, and the posture and the attitude that springs it up and makes it erect or puts you in a position where you feel like you have, have to make some, some sort of effort. Thank you. <clears throat> From uh, for those of you that haven't met Dor before, Dor Conforti. <laughs> so um, that's good. So kind of gone on for a long time here. I just want to have a quick look at see if what uh, I think that is everything that was uh, uh, it was almost everything that we missed yesterday and so we're going to have some stuff to carry on forward and maybe have a make up uh, or catch up uh, Q and A uh, sometime in the near future. But there's one more thing I think it's worth uh, addressing and I think it's fairly straightforward uh, from someone who knows himself as Jonic Manifold. And he says, uh, I truly Dasa, I have a purely practical question. I've decided to take a year off until I start graduate school next September to focus on meditation. I have a, boy, what a lucky guy to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I shouldn't say guy, Jonic Manifold might well be a woman, but what a lucky person you are to be able to do that. I have a few retreats planned and I will be ramping up my practice time from my current three hours a day to about five or six hours a day. Given this time budget, how should I schedule my daily practice? Should I allocate one continuous five hour block for practice each day, alternating walking and sitting, or should I split this up into smaller periods throughout the day? Would you have any other advice on how I can best use this year for awakening? Well, let's uh, address your first question here. Uh, there are times where um, using your five or six hours a day uh, as, uh, as an intensive meditation period, much the way that you would if, if you were on a retreat, is the best approach. Uh, but there are also those times when it'd be better to uh, do two shorter meditations or perhaps even three shorter meditations distributed throughout the day. Um, 
But this is something that I, I am saying this coming from my own experience on, on retreats. And I, I have sometimes the experience on retreat where uh, following the typical kind of schedule that's say, laid out where you have, you have several meditation periods during the day. And so you do sitting and walking in a series of shorter periods that are separated from each other by um, personal time, meal time, showers, uh, doing yogi chores, things like that. Uh, and the reason that, that that is such a, one of the reasons that's such a common structure is that for a lot of people, and I would say this applies most particularly to people who have not been meditating for a long time, uh, that uh, this, this is the best way to spend that time. You sound like you may be a much more longer term and serious meditator than that. So the other experience that I have on retreat is I'll find that I reach a point where uh, sitting for an hour and then getting up and walking uh, is just uh, not, not the right thing to do, that uh, I'll end up sitting for two hours or three hours or something like this. Now, likewise, there are times where I'll end up doing walking meditation in a very intense way, not for 45 minutes or an hour that's allocated in the schedule, but for uh, sometimes much more than that. And this is something that you, in, since you are doing structured retreats, uh, in this non-structured time, you have the opportunity to uh, do, to be, to work with yourself in the clearest possible way, recognizing what is working best for me now, and it's not necessarily what worked best for me yesterday or, or last week. Um, but this idea of something that's working best for me, like sitting for three hours and, 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 and walking for an hour after that, as opposed to alternating and sitting and walking, uh, what does it mean for this to, for one of these to be best for me at this, at this point? You need to have a pretty clear idea of where you, where you are and where you're trying to go. Um, uh, you're trying to develop attention in two ways. You're trying to develop uh, the uh, four grades of samadhi, the, be the beginner's samadhi, the uh, what's called in reference to jhanas, access samadhi, uh, what's also called in uh, reference to the jhanas, apana uh, samadhi, and then also the kanika samadhi, where the power of apana samadhi is something that can be, um, uh, the object of which does not need to be fixed and can be changed. If in you're in this training developmental stage of the process. Likewise, uh, this is, is true. The other aspect of the, how you use attention is you're, you, you're developing vipassana. You're seeing things as they are. You're seeing beyond conceptualizations. You have experience of seeing uh, less processed uh, information arriving in consciousness. Uh, and you're able to compare it with the more processed information that arises in consciousness. You even see relatively um, unprocessed or, or, or kind of raw information arising in consciousness. So this is the development of, uh, of that aspect of your attention that is most appropriately described as vipassana. Along with this, you're also trying to develop very powerful metacognitive introspective awareness, or uh, sati is, is awareness, and that metacognitive introspective awareness is uh, the sati sampajana, 
Uh, so if you know what you're trying to develop and you're in the, in the develop, place of developing skills, then that, that is the criteria by which you decide, is this what is working for me best uh, in this period of time, whatever it is. Uh, the sitting longer uh, or more frequent and shorter sits or breaking it up or doing it continuously. What is contributing to the development of these different abilities. When you move into the adept stage, uh, adept stages of, of your practice, then there, there is the process of exploring your own mind with a high degree of isolation from external factors. And uh, that's a, the ability to do that is, is a wonderful thing that you, the skills you've developed allow you to do that. Very, very wonderful thing. Uh, but there's also a tremendous value in getting out of your head and into your body and into the world. And uh, sometimes that goes beyond doing uh, walking meditation. That, that involves... That's where, uh, that's where doing yogi chores in a retreat comes in. That's where meals and all kinds of other activities could, could come in and when combined with your meditation, become uh, what, is, what works best for you at that time. So I can't give you an answer and say, well, you should be meditating continuously X number of days or dividing or, or hours, uh, dividing up each day into X number of periods of uh, Y duration or things like that. You're in the position to discover this for yourself and recognize that it's going to change. It's not always going to be the same. And so I think just knowing that what's going to work best for you is not always going to be the same is the best possible guidance I can give you on this. Drop the idea that there's a best way to do it. Because uh, the, the best way to do it is the way that happens to be best on that particular day or part of the day or a week or whatever it is that you're talking about. So hopefully that is helpful to you. Um, do I would have any other advice on how I can best use this year for awakening? In addition to meditation, there, yes, do those, and, and meditation should include, of course, things, things like metta meditation and so forth. But don't forget analytical meditation, because that's very important. The being mindful in a non-meditative context in this year that you have, there are times when the best thing that you can do is to be interacting with people, to interact with situations, to practice being mindful, not just in the context of formal meditation practice, but of being more and more mindful outside of that. Um, so, um, don't please don't approach this wonderful year you have as something that that you're going to gain the maximum benefit of by doing what somebody might do if they were in a cave in the Himalayas or in a kuti in the forests of Thailand or Burma or something like that. Um, a very important part of this is applying the entire eightfold path, and you cannot apply the entire eightfold path while you're sitting on your butt or walking back and forth on a meditation path. You have to engage in order to do that. And uh, you cannot understate the fact that this is an eightfold path, that the meditation is a very important part of it, but it is only one part of it. And uh, it really, you need to develop, you know, it's, uh, it's like, uh, a an eight stranded rope where the where the strands are all uh, uh, 
wrapped around each other. They're in, intertwined. Um, an undeveloped strand makes for a weak rope that can break under uh, uh, under tension. So for maximum success and a maximum pro progress, you need to recognize that and practice not just meditation, but the Eightfold Path. Don't just do formal practice, but engage in the world. And once again, that's something that you have this opportunity to learn what for you is the right, right amount of each of these, uh, and it will vary over time. So I think I've gone on about as much as I can go on for this, for this particular gathering. <laughs> I, I hope it's uh, valuable and useful for you. And uh, yeah, we, we'll finish. We'll find a time to finish off the next set of questions. And uh, I, I think we. I I'd really appreciate some feedback. People can just post notes on Patreon, but idea of doing two sessions at two different times so it accommodates people in different time zones. Uh, it just makes sense to me that, that this is going to be far more effective. Uh, and I'd love feedback, uh, including we did one of these things on a, a Sunday, a non-work day, but uh, then it occurs to me that, well, maybe the people who 10 o'clock works for uh, are the uh, in Arizona, Arizona time are people that that's their you know they they may be uh, uh, maybe evening for them uh, four o'clock in the afternoon for somebody else may be a time that they're at work and things like that so uh, perhaps for the four o'clock session should be on the weekend I don't know if I get feedback I can make it easier for us to come up with a formula that we can stick to consistently and benefit everybody as much as possible. So I'll leave you with that uh, favor might, that I'm asking. You might put that uh, that request for feedback into the Patreon. So it gets sent out uh, yeah. as, as a request to get more information. Wonderful. Since there's only a few that. people here. Yeah. I did answer uh, 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 an email uh, where uh, uh, the person I was just, whose question, Bert Elsie, Elsie, I, I did kind of put that into um, uh, an answer to his post, but I think I'll make it as a separate post that becomes more prominent because it might not be seen by people reading through that. Wonderful suggestion, Bill. Thank you. And I, I, I do appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you for giving me your time. And uh, hopefully I've been able to uh, do some things that are helpful for, for you, so. Thank you very much. My love to you and Nancy and everyone there. Thank you very much. And, uh, likewise, my love to all of you. Thank you, Yes, thank you.